What are the economics of love? My name is Natalia Ivanova, parenthesis mount, and um, I'll talk to you today about my work, which is very much about the economics of love. For the past many years, I've been interested, but for the past five years, I've been interested, I'm a curator and an artist hybrid. And um, I've been very interested in um, the idea of how libidinal economy um, enters the conversation or how the libidinal economy is connected to the um, art economy and our relationship and how we um, interact and how we reciprocate being part of the art marketing machine. So through, um, through um, so I, I, I've been using tools that Okay, so there's several, several parts of my work that in a way explores the theme of desire and how desire connected to economy, which is the, um, the, uh, the ultimate um, tool for um, capitalism to enact uh, and enslave us in a way, is to use desire as a way of uh, commodifying um, um, our feelings, right? So love is commodified as uh, and packaged and sold on the market as um, um, to, 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 to enact the supply and demand, which is part of the economics, right? However, at the same time, desire is also a big part of how we um, interact with each other within the um, art system. Um, because we also enact desire as, as, uh, as artists, as curators, as thinkers, as writers, um, and then we allow that to drive our relationships, our projects, our uh, communication even, and uh, we release that desire to the world in, in, in the form of projects and, 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 and events and, and work that is then again very quickly being commodified by the market, by the art market, and packaged as a um, as a commodified object, right? So, um, for a, um, as I said, for a while I've been thinking about how do we bring, um, how we de-traumatize ourselves and how do we, in a way, um, uh, become autonomous in actually, um, uh, in actually holding the desire for ourselves and working against or sort of like subverting the idea of this commodified image of desire. Uh, not in image, but how do we actually ourselves occupy the, um, the IP, the intellectual property, in order to um, um, hold our desires and our image for ourselves and also profit from our image and desire ourselves rather than the general economy and the economy we feed, which is the art market. So, several years ago, I collaborated with a friend of mine, Mark, Mark Herbs, uh, who is um, a writer and an artist himself and a thinker, and we wrote this book, The Commons of Friends and Lovers. And this book was written um, during uh, COVID uh, as an exquisite corp project, a corpse project, and uh, he lives in Leipzig. I lived at that time in Oakland, California. And um, we went back and forth. We started the project with the idea is that during COVID, um, all of us, um, I mean, basically, the, the basic tenets of interacting with each other and working in the art field just fell apart because we didn't have, we had the distance and we, we couldn't be with each other and we couldn't organize together. So we began thinking, how do, how do we connect this? Also, both of us were going through different personal crises at that time, and ups and downs, and disappointments and disillusions. And um, uh, at that point as well, um, I had um, worked on um, the first art commons in Oakland, California, called Pro Arts Commons, um, which I was a part of an organization that I ran, which is Pro Arts Gallery in Oakland, California. And so my feelings were quite mixed, um, again, because the personal entered the, uh, the public, the private entered the public, and, and it always does um, as creators, right? 
And so, and he was going through different, as I said, uh, personal and kind of like professional crises during that time. So we decided to write a book in a way, and it kind of came organically to us um, exactly about that. How, what are the politics of desire, basically? How do we um, negate, negate the personal and the public within what we do in the art world and how we organize and how we actually work with each other and how much of that is fucked in a way because we are all trauma bonding in the comments a lot of the time so when we organize and how um, important it is to um, sort of pay attention to the personal way the de-traumatizing all of our personal relationships so then we can actually re, um, rewire the broken circuits between audience, community and the artist, right? I'm sorry, audience, community and the institution um, that we participate in, the art institution, the art market. And so this book, um, I think it's really interesting in the context of the economics of love because it actually, um, in a way, through us quite sort of like, you know, um, uh, in this exquisite corpse mode, went back and forth with each other, we began in the beginning quite intent to write a book about, like, a book about the commons and about the art economy and, and COVID and all of this and what we were going through. And then I believe that towards the, 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 middle, of the, <laughs> the middle of our process, and it took two years, by the way, to, for us to, to get this book out in the world, is to, um, we realized that actually we are writing about that personal crisis way more than anything else because we are traumatized and pissed and upset and disappointed and, uh, and, and crying all the time and like nothing worked in our personal lives in a way and that in a way gave us the idea to um, discuss how this again, how our um, personal um, uh, relationships, right? And that's why the comments of friends and lovers actually underpin the whole economy of art, right? And how a lot of the times the libido economy, they say there's no social organizing that doesn't take that in consideration or it's not underpinned by that. But by libido economy, I mean the relationships like love, desire, sex, um, all of this is actually the, 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 the foundation of how we actually built this new economy together, this solidarity economy together, this mutual ed together. And so in this frame, through this frame, um, I became further interested in actually connecting my personal practice um, from there on, you know, in a way, to the way that we um, built this new economy, right? So when we talk about this new solidarity economy, this new solidarity economy, Short, uh, economy, you know, solidarity and sharing economy, how do we reframe the value of what we do and our art labor within the context of these economies that we're building, right? So um, this is um, a sort of like three-layered approach that I have always and I work very much with schematics, so with schemes, uh, what um, I guess this is like the way that I um, embody my ideas, but it has become also a process of um, organizing a lot of various and a lot of the times diverse and chaotic ideas and synthesize them within a practice and a process. Um, so um, I call that memory mapping um, because in a way um, I enact um, exactly that, like memory mapping both my um, personal relationship to the arts, to art, and being an art laborer and cultural producer, so then um, sort of also on the personal level, um, really um, talk about my trauma as as a human being, but also as as um, participants in the art economy, which often is quite dirty, and so. Um, so I have two walls. This wall is m almost more like my personal process that I go through in order to um, 
I guess, reclaim the autonomy of our, of our image and our desires. Um, and at the same time, I have the public version of it, which is the commons that I'm interested in building, um, the, um, the collective, the, the currency, the affinity groups, the, you know, the spaces that we, the places we build, the communities we create, um, the partners we, we choose to have in our um, adventures, right? Because a lot of the times, the toxicity that we find our relationships when we work with each other within the art market is actually based on personal trauma and our personal um, personal relationships. So it's very so it's kind of like a relational approach to um, economy and the economy and the legal kind of uh, systems in the art world. So on this wall, I'll start with that, and it's kind of like a narrative. I began doing this. Um, transgressive drawings, I call them, but they're a representation, again, of um, personal um, um, ways of, again, embodying um, feelings, you know, mostly traumatic feelings. And um, by doing those um, sort of like very fast and um, chaotic, but quite sort of like um, strategic outputs, um, I, I have a context now through several different layers that again I call memory mapping to actually um, communicate a bigger idea about reframing the image, reframing and uh, reclaiming the, the desires that we have and our intellectual property. So I also um, have worked with um, um, a collective, a body shy uh, uh, in Madrid, um, and in 2020, during COVID, on May 1st, we secured the first uh, um, U.S. Congress copyright license for um, performances uh, uh, by Davis Americanos, which is a, um, a name that anybody can choose to enact um, again, um, personal and political traumas under this and, and, and sort of like connecting the political and the social with art um, to, safe, to safely or to rather transgress the idea that uh, of copyright and uh, of, 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 uh, of intellectual property, right? So from there on, I also am interested through my work and through the way of collaborating with institute, with other artists and, 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 uh, and creatives on how do we occupy collectively our intellectual property and our, our intellectual space. And then also, you know, how do we actually, if we're going to reclaim that, how do we actually um, uh, make money with, 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 with that? And how, how do we get paid for intellectual um, labor? which never gets rewarded, never gets recognized. And a lot of people, of course, think that artists, when they're in the studio, they're completely unproductive and just, just having fun and doing nothing. But the idea is that, again, if we all can collaborate on projects that actually do speak uh, to the fact that we actually, uh, that occupying this intellectual space together and then copywriting it with this experimental license actually creates the conversation and discourse on, on how do we hold um, our own and how do we hold each other in, in a world that is equitable and fair and, 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 uh, and it's not based on, um, on, the, on the market tenants that we usually execute in our work. It's, not, it's, 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 our, it's ours to hold and to, to procreate and benefit from, right? So um, it's funny because this also, uh, so uh, in, in a very strange way, you know, um, again through this memory mapping process, a lot of the times um, I put up on the wall thoughts and ideas that are um, fairly, um, that are connected with the way we love and the way we interact with each other, that then I'm very interested in connecting those thoughts and ideas with um, our art labor and with the art economy and how 
actually we're being most of the time oppressed and um, and subjugated by with our own participation with our own with our own bodies in it um, in that system. So these are two checks, for example. I think that's funny. I worked in a gallery in New York City um, some years ago, which uh, of course are fake. I never got paid for my um, almost one year work as a director of this gallery, and that is very, very, uh, um, that is not a story even anymore because that's what happens a lot of the times, right? So I have kept these checks since like, maybe like they're like 20 years old, these checks at this point. But again, um, working from this kind of like trauma and then creating a way of actually, again, you know, this is your intellectual property, this is my image. I've been working with the idea of selfie and sort of like subverting the, the object of desire that we are bombarded with every day um, in media and social media and press and everywhere um, and reframing this in a way for myself even as reclaiming it to, to own it myself but at the same time working with that image also as a form of advertisement, as a social advertisement for, uh, uh, again, for, for thoughts and very very important thoughts that we should be thinking of, or discourse, right? So I layer these images uh, with, um, with um, text, right? Very simple, but it's interesting again, because it's again working with the idea of the, um, uh, in the tradition of the situation is, and kind of like culture jamming and uh, sub, uh, sub advertising and all of these kind of mediums from the past, but then reclaiming it today as our tools so actually, again, reclaim our bodies, our desires, our images, and, and, and occupying this intellectual space with, um, with a very serious and very important discourse that we all should be kind of like enacting and embodying, you know. And how are we actually authentic through this process is another thought of mine. So my current work consists of, of having this part of uh, this kind of like um, uh, created image and then recreating it and then reframing it all the time and then connecting that with the idea of intellectual property uh, which I'm creating and then a lot of the times in collaboration and then currently we're thinking about a cryptocurrency that actually is connected to this um, beyond the NFT situation but it could be also an NFT and how we can actually use this um, individual artist brands that we continually and all the time create to actually monetize and, and, and serve ourselves at the end and as a collective, right? Uh, at the same time, I, again, you know, through that process, I've been very, I've been very interested in, in very basic and abstract and super abstract and super abstract things like what is love, right? What is the economic of love? Or how um, how do we find commonalities despite our differences, right? And how, how to actually transgress um, norms and ideas and even very popular ideas, like how do we transgress polyamorous so then we can actually talk about important, like you know what I mean, like so we can actually talk about the, the very foundation of our relationships beyond um, these categories that we often put ourselves into, you know. So this, um, this to me, it's kind of like also a very interesting representation of the economics of, of love, because this is a very strange scheme that I, I kind of like came up with one day, but it's also very, very uh, simple because love multiplies. So if you love one person, then that person loves two more people, and then that person loves five more people, then we, um, uh, again, we kind of like multiply, we, we give love, right? And it's, and it's the most difficult thing, in my opinion, through my cultural practice, how do we hold um, space, but how do you also hold people in that space, right? And maybe sometimes you don't hold them, maybe you transgress a lot of the space together with those people, because then if you realize that this is sort of like the foundation of how we um, embody our authenticity in terms of feelings, right? And also the idea of authenticity is also contested through that work of consistently reframing 
oneself through the image, then how do we get from here to the topography of our feelings, communicating, no, communica no communication, who betrayed us, who is watching you, who is in love with you, all of this, it becomes like, again, the economy of feelings that we enact on a daily basis, both through our own beings, but also working with each other, and how can that help, again, in finding common grounds to build a, um, a new system that we can operate in and, again, reframe our very uh, important relationships that, um, that are broken, in my opinion, uh, between artists, audience, and the institution, right? The, the, and, and that hierarchy of inside, outside, public, private, this duality of, of, of um, this duality in general.